parents raised me as one of Jehovah's Witnesses, and um, I realized from a very young age that some of the things that they had been teaching me there weren't really lining up with some of the things that I was reading in the Bible. And I am actually telling my parents I'm getting baptized, and um, this may be the last time I get to talk to them. I don't know. I'm Savvy, and this is part of my story. My parents raised me as one of Jehovah's Witnesses, and so as I got older, I started noticing that because I wasn't as devoted or as into it as a lot of other people were, I was excluded from a lot of things. I finally reached a point where I just didn't have almost anybody, and so my mom um, signed me up for a homeschool science team, and um, that's where I met the guy who would later become my fiance. So he started telling me about his church and about the things that they did there and about what they believed. And I started thinking to myself, wow, that sounds a lot more in line with the Bible and a lot more comforting and a lot nicer and a lot more like a loving environment than what I've been growing up in. I still remember when I first decided to leave, I had talked to my mom about it for a while and I had been talking to her saying, I don't think I wanna be here anymore. And my dad kind of picked up on it, but he, I didn't, I hadn't really flat out told him yet. So he told me that if I wanted to leave, I had to talk to the elders of the congregation and told them that that's what I wanted to do. And um, they announced in front of the entire congregation of all of my friends and family that I was no longer Jehovah's Witness and all my friends pretty much disowned me after that and never really spoke to me again. And since I hadn't really had a whole lot of friends outside of that, I just was all alone. I didn't have any friends and my dad didn't want me going to another church until I turned 18. So that was a year that I was just by myself, just me and the Bible and God. During that year that I was on my own and just didn't really have a community, didn't really have a church, um, Will, who I was starting to date at the time now that I was out of there, said that he would call me every single night and read the Bible with me and say a prayer with me until I was able to go to church again. <laughs> And he did every single night for a solid year, did not miss a single one. Baptism was something that was not a foreign idea to me. That was something that the Jehovah's Witnesses did, but it was a lot more about being baptized into the church than about being baptized into God's community. And so I remember going to my baptism orientation and I was talking to Cindy Chavez about it and I was just thinking about it more. And the more I talked to her about it and the more I was kind of talking through it with God and kind of talking through it with myself, I just kind of came to the realization like this is a public declaration of my love for God. That is what this is. And if I am comfortable enough and proud enough to present this to the public, I am proud enough to present this to my dad regardless of what may happen because of it. And so I called him on the phone and I remember I just like rambled, rambled, rambled and it was like, so here's what I'm doing, I'm getting baptized. And it got really, really quiet and he just said, okay. And I was sitting here thinking, okay, that's it, that's it, okay. <laughs> And so he said, I hope you understand that you're making a really big mistake. And he said, but everyone just has to make their own mistakes and go through life. I just really hope that this doesn't mess up the rest of your life. And he said that he was really disappointed. And so I remember just trying so hard not to cry on that phone call. Like I knew that I was willing to tell him and willing to say, this is my decision, this is what I'm doing, this is something I'm proud of. And even if he did kick me out, I still had a spiritual father, my heavenly father taking care of me. And he was gonna make sure I had everything I needed, whatever happened. But he called me the very next day and he said, and I realized that this is the next logical step on your spiritual journey. And even if it's not where I thought you'd be, I'm still proud of you for making this decision. And that just blew my mind that he said that. I thought he was just calling to lay it on thicker, you know, that he was disappointed. And that just, I remember just crying tears of joy as he was saying that, because that was all I wanted to hear was that he was proud of me. I've always been super duper close with my parents, no matter what I've been through. And that remains the same. I'm still super duper close with both of my parents, especially my dad too. We um, spend a lot of time talking about God together, me and my dad actually. And just like talking about 
the different views that we both have and how they line up with each other sometimes. And it's really wonderful. And I still feel like my family accepts me after all of this. In terms of me and God moving forward, I mean, there's always going to be a few steps back every now and then. It's just celebrating him still continually moving forward. I was really excited when I found out that we were going to be playing that video on this weekend because it goes perfectly with what we're going to be talking about today. So take that and just keep it uh, for a while because we're going to unpack that a little bit later. Uh, it's really good to see you. I'm glad you're here and I'm really glad to be here too. Uh, so I am not an avid reader casually. I don't read casually a lot. It takes me a very long time to get through books. Uh, a friend of mine who's actually sitting here has loaned me a few books, and it's going to be a very long time until he gets those <laughs> books back, which he's starting to realize. Um, probably half of my casual reading uh, is taken up by the Harry Potter series, which is delightful. It's wonderful. Um, for as little of reading as I do, I very much value the prologue. Uh, the prologue, those first few pages that come before chapter one, uh, they can be uh, this terrible experience that makes you hate reading before you even start the book, or the prologue can be this beautiful thing that teases you with all of the joy and the sadness and tension and complexity and, and sense of humor that you're going to encounter in this book that you just picked up. The, the prologue can be like the appetizer to the book. Um, Appetizers and chain restaurants, they tend to be these massive cheap meals unto themselves where by the end of it, you may not even be hungry for any more food. You might even feel sick to your stomach. But what appetizers are supposed to be are these intentional masterpieces that awaken your senses and get you excited for the main course. That's what a good prologue can do. Uh, if I were to rearrange the books of the Bible, which I probably shouldn't, it's not a good idea, uh, I would make the book of Ruth the very first book of the New Testament. I would put it right in front of Matthew because I would make the book of Ruth the prologue to the Gospels. Uh, the Gospels are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These are the books that talk about Jesus' time here on earth, the things that he did, the things that he said. And I would make Ruth the prologue to the Gospels because in the book of Ruth are incredible images of things that would come when Jesus came. Uh, in this series of Ruth that we're going through together, uh, if you look for it, you will find foreshadowing of some of the beautiful things that Jesus has brought to our reality. So Ruth would make a good prologue for these reasons, but it would also make a good one because Ruth is Jesus' great, 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 great grandmother, which is really cool. So uh we're going to pick up where we left off. Last week, we started the book of Ruth. And in this section that we're looking at today, what I want us to do is I want us to look at this solely from Ruth's perspective, to see these things that are happening through uh, her lens. Uh, so the book of Ruth starts, and Ruth is from Moab. She was born in the country of Moab, and she is a Moabite. Uh, but one day, this family of Israelites moves to Moab, and this is an uncommon thing. Pastor Allen talked about that last week. Uh, and this family, there's a, a husband, a wife, and two sons. Now, over time, Ruth begins to form a connection with one of these sons, and they get married. Now, my hunch is, is that this marriage between these two is founded on this mutual, genuine love uh, for each other. Because Israelites, they didn't very often marry Moabites. This didn't happen quite that often. So uh, they get married, and Ruth becomes a part of this family. Uh, tragedy strikes this family, and uh, the father of the family dies, which is very sad. Uh, but the remaining family, which is Ruth, her husband, uh, her brother-in-law, her sister-in-law, and her mother-in-law, uh, this collective of people, for what could be up to 10 years, they function together as family. And during those what could be 10 years, they grow close to each other, and they love each other, and they support each other, and they this bond with each other. 
But then again, tragically, more people in this family die, and this time it's the two brothers. So the only family that's left is Ruth, her mother-in-law, and her sister-in-law. Now, back then in that day in time and culture, uh, three women in that situation could not survive on their own in that circumstance. So something needed to happen. And Ruth's mother-in-law is trying to figure out what to do. Uh, And we pick up with that in Ruth chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, which says this. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go, return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. So Ruth is following her mother-in-law back to Israel, back to Judah. And somewhere along the way, we don't know how far they got, maybe it was just a few hundred feet, Uh, her mother-in-law stops and turns towards her and her sister-in-law Orpah, and says to them, it would be better if you stayed here in Moab. And then she blessed them and kissed them and basically just let them go. And this is incredibly sad to Ruth and her sister-in-law. It says they wept, but this Hebrew word for wept here means this deep, sorrowful mourning. Like this is the type of weeping that you do when you just found out someone you loved has died. So they are mourning in this moment. See, these three women, they had just spent what could be up to 10 years functioning together as family and growing closer to each other. The intensity of this emotional reaction is a little bit striking for a couple of reasons. For one, these three women, they're not related to each other anymore. Like the only connection that they had was through the people that they had married. That's what brought them in the family together. They're all in-laws to each other, but no longer. But what is also striking about this is because the three of them are involved in what has historically been known as one of the most challenging relationships you can be in in the context of family, and that's mother-in-law and daughter-in-law. This is not always the case, but it seems like it always has been the case. Uh, There have been satirical poems found that date back to the Middle Ages, making fun of the challenges of that particular relationship. But we see that that's not the case here because Ruth and her sister-in-law, they are mourning in this moment after their mother-in-law just tried to tell them goodbye. And we see that that affection, it goes both ways because their mother-in-law did something very unexpected here. She blesses them. And a blessing is not a small thing at all. A blessing is an incredibly valuable thing to the Hebrew people because the Hebrew people, they believe in the power of words. Genesis says that God spoke creation into existence. And the Bible teaches us throughout the value of blessing each other, speaking and praying blessing over each other and the effectiveness of that and the importance of that. This is why we have a child blessing weekend instead of a child dedication weekend. This is why at the end of each of one of our services, someone gets up here and speaks and prays a blessing over us because there is power in words. And Ruth's mother-in-law prays a very powerful word over them, and it's the Hebrew word chesed. Now, chesed uh, is translated here to the word kindness, which is almost a disservice to the word because chesed is so much more than that. Chesed is a word for this deep, rich love that is consistent and it's constant. This is a love that overcomes any challenges or obstacles. This is a love that is greater than any kind of obligation. Uh, This love is tenacious. It is loyal. This is a stubborn love. And she blesses them by saying, may you experience the chesed of God. And she kisses them and they begin to weep. They begin to mourn. This is a very difficult goodbye for them. 
And I think almost all of us here have experienced a really difficult goodbye. I want to I want to tell you about one of mine. This is a picture of my closest friend. His name is Max. Um, clearly, it's been some time in the hair department since this picture has been taken. I miss. That, that was fun. Uh, good times. Um, Max and I, uh, Max was the best man in my wedding, and I was the best man in his. And this is actually a picture from uh, his wedding. We're sitting at the head table during the reception after the ceremony. Uh, and if you were at the reception and you had looked up at the head table, this is probably what you would have seen, is Max and I hanging out and talking and spending time together and joking and laughing together. It's something we really, really enjoy doing. The elbow in the lower left-hand corner, that's his wife. Um, she's a wonderful person. This picture might be a good representation of how our wives feel when our families get together. Him and I hang out, and they are the elbows in the lower left-hand <laughs> corner. Uh, so Max and I, we met in college, and uh, we became roommates his last year of college. So we spent a whole year living together. And during that time, uh, a very pure and unadulterated bromance was formed. Uh, if you are a man, I hope that you get to experience all of the love and joy of a bromance. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, and at the end of that school year where we lived together, uh, we actually went to Canada together for the summer. We worked at a summer camp there. Uh, and that was an experience of itself. It was incredible. But at the end of that summer, uh, I knew I had to come back here to finish up my senior year of college at UNC. Uh, but Max felt like God was calling him to stay in Canada, probably because of the elbow in the lower left-hand corner. Uh, she's Canadian. She's a wonderful person. Uh, <clears throat> But this was very sad for us uh, because we had spent this beautiful season of living together and experienced these things together. And now we realize circumstances were causing us to say goodbye. I very vividly remember the drive uh, to the Winnipeg airport. It was about a three hour drive uh, and we spent it listening to music and not talking about the fact that we were going to be leaving. It just felt like any other drive. Uh, he and I, we walked into the main terminal of the airport together and we got in line uh, for check-in and we stood there silently and we didn't say anything uh, until Max said something. To the best of my memory, Max said something like, well, I'm going to leave now because if I don't leave now, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to. Uh, so we give a very quick hug and an emotionally toned down goodbye because if we didn't, we would have just turned into a mess right there, or at least I would have. And he walked out the door and I got on the plane and we parted ways. Uh, we are seeing a very bittersweet goodbye taking place here in Ruth. Except after Ruth's mother-in-law says goodbye, the thing is, is they don't part ways. Uh, the next few verses say this, verses 10 through 14. And they said to her, no, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, turn back, my daughters, why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. And they lifted up their voices and they wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So Ruth's mother-in-law says goodbye, but Ruth and her sister say, no, we're staying with you. And Ruth's mother-in-law basically says it's very sweet, but it's also very stupid. Uh, Ruth has already been given a few reasons why she should stay in Moab. Uh, your home is here. Your family is here. And when she is blessed by her mother-in-law, what that communicates to her is that she is released from any obligation that she feels to stay with her. Like the relationship is over, the duty has been filled, she can go. 
And by the fact that Ruth chose to stay by her side shows us something about this relationship. It shows us that this relationship is made of something stronger than home. It's made of something stronger than family. And it's also made of something stronger than any kind of felt obligation. But her mother-in-law keeps giving more reasons why they should part ways. Uh, She says, I don't have any sons. And the reason why she brings that up was because back in that time, if your brother died to honor your brother, you would marry your brother's wife to carry on your brother's bloodline and honor your brother, but also to care for your brother's family uh, whom you love. It's a part of your family. But what her mother-in-law is saying here is there's no sons to carry on the marriage. Like if you followed me, You'd be on your own. Like there is no one to take care of you if you follow me. But then she says something really striking. She basically says, and I don't want you to follow me. See, back then, the most vulnerable situations that you could be in would be orphan, widow, or foreigner. And what Ruth's mother-in-law is trying to communicate here is that if Ruth followed her, she would become all three of these things. And that would hurt her mother-in-law's heart so deeply, it would be better for her mother-in-law if Ruth stayed home. Orpah is listening to all this, and she accepts it, and she decides to leave. And I don't blame her one single bit. She is not being disloyal. She is not being selfish. She is not being compassionless. She is simply listening to her mother-in-law and receiving these things as true because they are true. Like every single thing that she's saying is absolutely true about their situation. But it's that last thing that we see her say that would do it for me. If I was in Orpah's situation and this person that I love said, I don't want you to come with me. It would hurt me for you to come with me. That would decide it for me, and I would go home. So Orpah leaves. This started as this bittersweet goodbye, but what it's turning into is a breakup. And and those two things are very different because a breakup, it hurts on an entirely different level. Just that word breakup, it's taking something that's connected and forcibly breaking it apart until it's been separated. It's a violent thing. Breakups force us to face things that we don't want to confront. For example, if you are the one breaking up with someone else, uh, it means that you have had to come to terms with the fact that this relationship can't function in the way that it's supposed to. It just has no hope of doing so. Now, if you are the one being broken up with, you are forced to come to terms with this, whether you like it or not, from the other person. Or at least you're forced to come to terms with the fact that this person doesn't want to be with you anymore. And that's a bitter pill to swallow. But something that's also really hard in breakups is breaking up with someone that you still love. Because to break up with someone that you love means that you have had to come to the place where you realize that staying with this person isn't just hurting you, it's hurting them. And the kindest thing that you can do for that person in that moment is let them go. And that's the situation that Ruth's mother-in-law is in. She's trying to let them go. So she says goodbye, and her daughters-in-law say, no, no goodbye. And she says, no, you don't understand. This is not possible. It can't work. It's over. I'm breaking up with you. So Orpah walks to her mother-in-law and sadly kisses her with this act of loving affection, and then she walks home. But we see here that as Orpah is walking back home to Moab, Ruth clings to her. And that Hebrew word for cling, it's almost the opposite of our word for breakup. See, again, a breakup is taking something that's already connected and forcibly tearing it apart until there's a separation there. What this Hebrew word for cling is, is it's taking two things that are separated and forcing it to become together. It's fusing it together. Ruth fuses herself to her mother-in-law. And her mother-in-law responds like this. Verses 15 through 18. And she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. 
But Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. Your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me and more also if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said, no more. Ruth's just not getting the point here. And so her mother-in-law gives it two more reasons why she should go. She says, look, your sister left. It's okay. I'm not mad. Go. But then she brings up something really important. She points out that Ruth's gods are in Moab. And that's a really big deal because back then you couldn't just go to a different country and worship your old gods. That could be a death sentence. It still is today in some places. Um, but to all of this, everything that's transpired, Ruth says, enough, stop it. It hurts. See, Ruth puts all of her mother-in-law's arguments to rest in verses 16 and 17. She says, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. Your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me. And more also, if anything but death parts me from you. Now, in case you missed it, there was a genuine uh, conversion here from the Moabite God to the true God. That's incredible. But by saying, your God is now my God, and then making a vow to God in front of her mother-in-law, she just put her mother-in-law in checkmate because Naomi cannot oppose a vow that has been made to God. And Ruth just vowed to God that she would stay by her side. Ruth has made it abundantly clear that she is choosing to stay with her mother-in-law. In this whole thing, everything that we've read up to this point, something absolutely incredible is happening here. You see, every time Ruth's mother-in-law gives Ruth a reason why she should leave, and Ruth chooses, despite that, to stay we see something beautiful about this relationship being revealed. When Ruth chooses her mother-in-law over her home, we see the relationship is made of something stronger than home. When she chooses her mother-in-law over her family, we see that this relationship is made of something stronger than blood. When she chooses her mother-in-law, even though she has been blessed and let go from this relationship and released of obligation, we see that this relationship is made of something stronger than obligation. When Ruth chooses her mother-in-law, even though there's no sons to carry on the marriage, we see that this relationship is made of something stronger than just security. When Ruth chooses to stay by her mother-in-law stubbornly, even though her mother-in-law says, it hurts me for you to follow me, we see that the relationship is made of something stronger than just convenience or comfort. And when Ruth chooses the true God over the Moabite God, we see that this relationship is made of something stronger than just culture or tradition. You see, every time Naomi gives Ruth the opportunity to leave, what she's also doing is giving Ruth the opportunity to freely choose for herself to stay. And because Ruth had the freedom to choose this relationship, we see what the relationship really is made of. Chesed. Chesed is this constant, rich, consistent love that overcomes challenges and is greater than any kind of obligation. This is a tenacious, loyal, stubborn, free love. Chesed is the difference between a zoo and the Serengeti. Hased is the difference between watching an arranged marriage couple meet for the first time and watching Jim and Pam fall in love. Hased, it's the difference between a diet and an all-you-can-eat buffet. Hased is the difference between buying a bouquet of flowers on Valentine's Day and just buying a bouquet of flowers on any other day. Hased is the adult who invites their aging parents to spend the remaining years of their life in their home. Hased is the spouse who refuses to sign the divorce papers because they haven't given up hope yet. Chesed is the person who sticks by their roommate's side through their terrible depression. 
Chesed is the parent who never stops praying for their child to come back home and follow Jesus. Chesed is what Ruth and her mother-in-law's relationship is made of. And if we are lucky enough in this lifetime, we get to experience that with someone else. But like I said, Ruth would make the perfect prologue to the Gospels because the love that we see between these two people is exactly the type of love that Jesus has to offer us. The love that Ruth has for her mother-in-law is just a glimpse of the type of love that Jesus has for us. And he gives us the opportunity to choose that relationship for ourselves. The chesed love of Jesus does not force us into it through obligation. And it's not held back from us by any challenge or, or obstacle. The love that Jesus has for us, it is loyal, it is stubborn, it is tenacious, it is constant. And he gives us the free opportunity to choose that for ourselves because it's in the freedom of choice that love is the absolute strongest and purest and most powerful. And the cool thing is, is that throughout the gospels, like Naomi, Jesus is very clear and upfront with what a relationship with him could mean for us, what following him could mean for us. And some of these verses that I'm talking about, they can be quite jarring to read. Like they can read almost like Jesus is trying to convince us to not follow him. But that's not what's going on at all. See, what if these verses that, that are jarring to read, what if Jesus is just giving us the honest, transparent, loving opportunity to choose to follow him freely? See, Jesus asks, do you choose me because your country or your government chooses me? Because I represent a different kingdom. Do you choose me because your family chooses me? Because following me could divide your family. Do you choose me because you believe that you're obligated to? Because I'm not forcing you into this. All I have is a free gift to offer you. Do you choose me because you want security? Well, John 16, 33, he says, I have said these things to you that you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. He says, do you choose me because you want to be comfortable? Matthew 16, 24, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Do you choose me in addition to the other gods that you're following? Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters for either he will hate one and love the other or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. See, Jesus, he doesn't pull this bait and switch routine with us. He doesn't catfish us. He is open and honest from the very beginning about what following him could mean for us. But in doing so, he, in an act of pure love, is giving us the free opportunity to choose him for ourselves. Because it's only in the freedom of choice that we can find chesed. I don't know if you've ever seen uh, a ship being built in a dry dock uh, before, but uh, a dry dock, it's this shallow ramp that leads into the water and ships are, are built on this ramp so that when they're completed, they can slide into the water. Now, way back when, while a ship was being built in a dry dock, it was propped up by these large wooden posts that would support the sides of it. And it would keep the ship sturdy and upright and secure. But the other thing that these posts would do is they would prevent the ship from sliding into the water. So in that sense, you could argue these posts, they're keeping this ship from actually becoming a ship because it's only in water that a ship is actually able to be what it has been designed to be. So when a ship was completed being built in a dry dock, what they would do is they would knock these wooden posts out and that would free the ship to slide into the water. It's possible that our relationship, or at least a part of it, is being 
with Jesus is, is being held up with something other than a choice that we've made. Maybe there's a part of it that's been chosen for us, or maybe there's this obligation that we feel, and that might make that relationship feel like it's being held upright and solid and secure, but what those things are actually doing is also keeping that relationship from becoming what it was designed to be. But every time Jesus gives us the opportunity to choose him, He's giving us the opportunity to knock one of those posts out from underneath that relationship. Maybe Jesus was chosen for you because of where you lived. Maybe you grew up in a really small town where everybody, like everybody went to church on Sunday. It's just what you did. But then you moved away for college or for some other reason. And you made the decision to go to church by yourself for the very first time. That's knocking a post out. Maybe... Uh, Jesus was chosen for you by your family. You grew up in a Christian home and they weren't hypocritical or, or backwards. They were loving, wonderful followers of Christ. But you just came to this point where you realize that your faith was actually your parents' faith. But in realizing that, you decided to try to pursue following Jesus on your own. That's knocking a post out. Maybe you grew up uh, or were presented with Jesus with this very legalistic perspective that was based on threats of hell if you didn't stop sinning. But looking through the scriptures and and coming to church, you're starting to realize that Jesus describes something that can't be earned or deserved, but it's just a free gift of salvation, where as soon as we accept it, there's nothing we can do to cause that to disappear. If you're coming to terms with that for the first time and embracing that, that is knocking a massive post out from underneath that relationship. Maybe you were told that following Jesus would bring you health and wealth and prosperity, but you're starting to realize that following Jesus might mean the opposite of health and wealth and prosperity for you but you're starting to see that the spiritual things that come with that relationship are far more valuable than those other things. And you choose to follow Jesus anyway. That's knocking a post out. Maybe you were told that following Jesus would be easy, but anytime Jesus invites you to follow him into something challenging or difficult or hard and you follow him anyway, that is knocking a post out. Maybe you thought following Jesus would fit with your lifestyle, but you're starting to realize that the life that Jesus is calling you into is different from the other one, and it's just pulling you apart, that tension. Deciding to walk away from that and walking towards him, that is knocking a post out. Do you remember that video that we watched? Man, I cannot think of a better example of what it means to freely choose She knew that following Jesus could mean the permanent end of her relationship with her parents, but she chose to follow him anyway. Do you remember the look on her face when she came out of the water? That's what knocking a post out can do to our relationship with Jesus. When we are given the opportunity to choose, when we decide to choose for ourselves an aspect of that relationship for the first time, what it does is it allows that relationship to slide into the water and become what it was always meant to be. Every time Ruth was given the opportunity to leave, She was also given the opportunity to choose to stay. And that shows us how beautiful and genuine of a relationship and a love that was. Looking at it in this way, we could say that Jesus really does give us every opportunity to not follow him. But in doing that, what he is really doing is giving us every opportunity to freely choose to follow him ourselves. And when we do, we see how beautiful and genuine and real that love is that he has for us. And every time we choose to follow him, we more clearly understand that before all this, he has already chosen us. Let's pray. I want to give you uh, a space to process these things uh, just between you and God. Um, So I'm going to ask you a question tied into some imagery that 
we brought up. We talked about a ship um, being in the water or being held out of the water in a dry dock. I want you to think about your relationship with Jesus and uh, see if you can answer this question for yourself. Is that relationship freely moving in the water or is it being held up in a dry dock? Okay, so maybe uh, this was a moment where excitedly you realize, wow, my relationship really is that free, and that's fantastic. Or, but maybe you realize uh, your relationship with Jesus or just a part of it is being held up by some posts um, that are keeping it upright and secure, and, and it might feel that way, but they could be holding that relationship back from freely being what it was designed to be. So I'm going to give you a question in that context for you to just ask God, and I understand encourage you to just silently give the Holy Spirit the space to answer this question for you. Uh, so here's the question I want you to ask God. God, is there an aspect of our relationship that is being held back? Is there an area of our relationship that was chosen for me or I feel obligated to? Okay, maybe that's a question that you need to take with you this week, and that's fantastic. Um, or maybe that answer was given to you right away. If that's the case, I want to give you an opportunity to respond to that. Uh, so here's a moment that I want to give uh, to you between you and Jesus. If, if an area came to mind that maybe was chosen for you or you feel obligated in, I want to give you the space to choose Jesus in that area. So what I want you to do in this moment, if that's you and that's where you're at, just take a moment between you and Jesus and say, Jesus, in this area, I choose you. Jesus, you went through so much to secure a relationship with us. And in that sense, you have already chosen us, but you love us so much and that love is so pure that you did not force us into that relationship. You do not obligate us to follow you. But to keep that relationship pure and full of love, you've given us the opportunity to choose you. Thank you. Jesus, I am sure every single one of us in this room has an area of our relationship that maybe has been chosen for us or we feel obligated by. I pray that during this moment that we have to just worship you, you would bring those things to mind and that you would allow that relationship to further slide into the water and be free. Jesus, you have chosen us and we have the opportunity to freely choose you. And it's out of gratitude that we worship you in that.